Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. And thank you, TEDx Glasgow, for coming up with this intriguing overarching theme this year, a disruptive world. Let's explore that a little, shall we? Uh, I think it's funny that most fairy tales nowadays end with a catchy phrase, they lived happily ever after. And that seems to coincide roughly with the wedding. So the idea is you get married and then you live happily ever after. It's like you have arrived at this status quo of happiness which will continue onwards. But now, I don't know about you, you know, but my life changed somewhat. You know, some nine months later, actually. Lo and behold, disruption. Well, now, th thankfully, I could turn to, to books, to the internet, to friends, family, anyone willing to listen, really. <laughs> um, I had to learn a whole new language, a strange alien language of parents. I mean, seriously, have you heard them speak? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've heard people talk about baby slings, you know, changing stations. So one of my favorite, the baby bouncer. You know, it's, it's a whole new language. You know, people whom I had never met you know, came up to me in the park and to tell me all sorts of random stories about their children, whom I had also never met. <laughs> it, it seems that the moment you become a parent, uh, you're automatically enrolled in the secret society of parents. <laughs> right? They flock together in parks and compare notes, if you will. And I, I think parents do this to, um, to, to find comfort with one another, you know? Or, or if you're confident enough, you can tell someone else that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, generally uh, speaking, my life had been uh, disrupted uh, somewhat, you know? But m my disruption was easily managed, you know? I could find the right information to fill the gap. I could find some solace at times of discomfort. Really, I mean, I had nothing to complain about. You know, my wife would kill me if I did. <laughs> but if you're a baby, this is quite different. You know, babies experience disruption far worse than this. You know, not once, but ten times before they're even two years old. Well, yeah, I know. But before we dive into this untold agony of our young ones, it, let's explore disruption a little further, but from our own viewpoint, shall we? Uh, who has experience with puberty? <laughs> really, no one, no. The, the midlife crisis, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, the point is, there are stages in all of our lives where our, let's say, perception of the world is challenged uh, somewhat. You know, and, and we all recognize puberty as one of those phases. Don't we? I mean, there is just no escaping puberty. Regardless of where you were born in the world, regardless of what race you belong to, um, regardless of the culture or um, um, faith that you have embraced as your own, regardless of how much money you have in the bank, there is just no escaping puberty. It's as simple as that. It happens to everybody, and it happens roughly at the same age too. Right? And we come together with the Secret Parent Society every now and again, and we talk about puberty. Well, we moan about it, really. Um, you know, you hear people say, you know, my daughter doesn't clean up her room. And somebody else say, well, my son doesn't do any homework. Or another one might say, well, my child basically doesn't do anything. <laughs> you know, but so we, we all agree, nonetheless, that puberty is a very challenging phase. And not only for the parents. Um, but for children too, apparently. Just imagine what your life is like if puberty hits you in a very condensed form, not once, but ten times in the first two years. Now, in those first two years, our perception is formed. That is to say, the structure of our perception is formed. What we do with that perception is up to us, but mostly up to our experiences. 
our perception consists of 10 layers, which are carefully crafted and stacked one on top of the other. And every layer acts as a filter, if you will, on top of the perception that was already there. So everything that you have come to experience, see, smell, sound, and all that, drastically changes when a new layer is added. Right? Just to, to, to summarize this first bit a little bit, every baby in the world, regardless of race, culture, background, money in the bank and all that, go through 10 of these leaps, these stages, where a layer of perception is created. They are age-linked, and puberty takes a few years, but when you go further back in time, we can tell you to the accuracy of a week, almost, exactly when that will happen in the developing mind of a baby. Right? Now, imagine this, you go to bed one night and you know exactly what your room looks like. You know where the light switch is, you know where the closet is, you know where everything is, you know how everything sounds, what everything tastes like, what everything looks like. Right? You pretty much have control over your own world, you know the world that you live in. But you wake up then, the next day, and everything is different. You don't recognize the room, sounds are different, tastes are different, Everything has changed. Everything has changed. Well, this is how a baby perceives a leap. Now, I tried to explain this yesterday to a group of students, and they looked at me kind of like, yeah, mate, we know what you're talking about. That's pretty much how we wake up every morning since we went to uni. <laughs> but you get the general gist of it. Um, so the perception has completely changed, but that is just one leap. Now, as I said, this happens sort of 10 times in the first uh, two years. Let me try to explain that with a metaphor, if I can. Um, think of the brain as if it were a big city, you know, like Glasgow, for instance. It's a big city, and it's completely dark. It's completely silent. You smell nothing, you hear nothing, you taste nothing. It's, you have no idea where you are, and you have no idea what comes next. And then suddenly, the lights are turned on, in Buchanan Street, for instance. Only in that part of the city, right? And only in that part of the city. That is what a baby experiences for the first time in the fourth week after the expected delivery date. So they're completely overwhelmed. There are sounds, there is noise, there is everything there. So they're completely taken aback by this. I mean, they're like, holy diaper. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they're petrified, they're scared. And, and this is where we can observe disruption, real disruption for the first time. Children get all fussy. Um, research has indicated that this, is, um, this coincides with a, a rapid development of the brain. So part of the brain unfolds, for lack of a better expression. When you look at MRIs before, you see sort of new areas of the brain being there that weren't there before. Um, and that's when parents tend to get real anxious and real nervous. You know, because their child was fine the, f the, the day before, and today completely inconsolable. You know, they don't know what to do. Now, the best advice here is uh, TLC, tender love and care. It's impossible to spoil your baby with attention in the first 60 weeks anyway. After those 60 weeks, a child might take some advantage of your kind nurture, but before that, there is no such thing as too much love. And we receive these phone calls and emails from parents who have been given the advice to just let your baby cry, it's good for the lungs. You know, it's not. And it's frustrating to hear that, actually. It's not teething, it's not cramps, it's probably a leap in mental development. So that's the first phase of, of a leap, and a leap consists of three stages. So the first phase is that regression period, when that part of the brain sort of unfolds, if you will. The second phase is when a baby sort of calms down. They, they've got a sense of you know, what that part of the metaphorical city looks like. They calm down a bit and they want to test those new abilities, but under your guidance as a parent, sort of testing the water, if you will. Now, it gets to be really funny in stage three, and that's the stage that we love the most. In stage three is when a child gets to explore the potential that is unlocked by that new part of the brain that has been unfolded. It unlocks, if you will, potential. And every layer in perception 
unlocks a new level of potential. Potential that we get to develop. I mean, so why do we call it Wonder Weeks, it says there? Um, because, you know, I've been just talking about the pinnacle of disruption in babies' minds. It sounds a bit harsh to call it wonderful then, doesn't it? I mean, we call it Wonder Weeks because we see these wonders in the third phase, when children get to develop their potential, if you will. Right? And um, what we've listed in our research is basically all the potential that a baby could develop around one of these leaps. A baby obviously doesn't develop everything. Um, it's a bit the same as being able to play the piano. I mean, everybody in this room today has the potential of playing the piano. That doesn't mean that everybody can, right? We're most of us simply choosing to pursue other avenues, right? Um, but you have the potential, and that potential can be developed. Now, having said that, um, I think it, uh, our research, sorry about that, uh, research also shows that the more we engage with our children, the more that we help our babies purposefully through these leaps and help them to discover this potential, um, the better they perform at school later on, the more confident they are. And interestingly enough, mostly girls seem to be far less ill if they have been helped purposefully through these leaps, interestingly enough. Um, and another thing, apart from the opportunity that we have, I think we have an obligation to help our children through these leaps. And the reason I'm saying that is because our friends at Harvard Medical Research um, have shown that, especially in the first year, an abundance of neurological connections is created in the brain. And after the first year, so when eight of the ten leaps have been already we've gone through them, um, the potential that hasn't been used, the neurological connections that haven't been used, are simply pruned away. It's preparing the brain for the next phase, the next step. And the stuff that you don't use, you lose. It's as simple as that. Right? Now, we've made this research available to parents already for many of years. If you think the primary caregivers should know this, they have the directest connection um, to these children. And, you know, we have received tons of emails and phone calls that serve for us as a stimulant to push on in our research. Um, but we're also delighted to find out now that the British Psychology Society has chosen to accredit our foundation course as well, one that we've just put online, so that professionals can take advantage of this too. Yes? Time says no, so I have to keep it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>